And welcome to a Morris Federation online event. Uh, today we have uh, myself, Pauline Woods Wilson, and Dennis Taylor, and also Beth Neal hosting. And um, I'd like to hand straight over to Peter Harrop, who's going to give us some histories of folk performance. Over to you, Peter. Thanks very much, uh, Pauline, uh, and, th and thanks to everyone for uh, joining us this afternoon. Um, very good of you to give your time. Uh, and uh, and thanks to the Morris uh, the uh, the Morris Federation for uh, in, inviting me. Uh, many thanks for that. Uh, so the title, uh, which you're probably aware of by now, "Custom and Creativity: The Chicken and Egg of Folk Performance Histories." Uh, and uh, what was in my mind with this was the um, the idea, which we often don't question, I think. Uh, that customs are things that have simply been there forever and in the modern era we get creative with them and tweak them and fiddle about with them. So I, I really uh, want to spend a little bit of time thinking about that and suggesting that things may be a little bit more complicated. <coughs> uh, many of the ideas have been expressed in this uh, recent publication, The Routledge Companion to English Folk Performance. Um, uh, one, one of the trickier aspects of this afternoon was uh, getting 600 pages into 45 minutes. But um, uh, so I wanted to say at the beginning that my views this afternoon are not necessarily shared by my fellow editor, Steve Roud, or our 26 excellent contributors, uh, some of whom I noticed were in the room. So I'm drawing on my own contributions to the book alongside my earlier volume, Mummer's Plays Revisited. Uh, and uh, really for the purposes of this afternoon, I am very interested in folk performance. I love folk performance, but I'm also interested in the ways in which we think about it. And I hope this afternoon will be a balance between those two things. Um, and if it gets to be a bit much on the how we think about it, uh, well, I'm afraid that's just how it is. <laughs> but I'll try to keep a balance. So thinking about creativity and the customary. These performance forms, our folk performance forms, and this afternoon I'm really focusing on Morris Sword and Mummer's plays, were devised by creative people in specific sets of circumstances. Despite all their disappearances and reappearances, their regional and historical differences, and having taken place in multiple contexts, they have achieved customary status, which I always think is quite a, a mysterious process of itself. What is it about what must once have been a brand spanking new performance at what point does that mysteriously morph into being traditional or customary? Thirdly, in my view, the Victorians and Edwardians, so really from about the 1860s through to the First World War, 1914, had a profound impact and still have a profound impact on the ways we've learned to regard and enact these traditional forms. And lastly, I want to ask, is it the case that some performances possess special features that allow us to regard them as a special category? And that's to say the category of folk performance, or if you like, what is it about one piece of performance that makes it folk and another piece non-folk? And that I believe is far from straightforward. So, uh, three premieres and a private variety show. That's a deliberate use of terminology to perhaps give us a gentle jolt out of the way we normally think about these things. But what we've got there is uh, are, are the earliest dates. Um, I, I always think that the earliest dates of kinds of folk performance are, are, are a bit like uh, the um, the bones that anthropologists keep finding. Uh, so that, you know, one year we think that the human race kicked off here and the next year we think it kicked off there and so on. So there'll always be new dates coming up. But broadly, 
In 1477, a Morris dance is noted in a civic watch parade in London in the June of that year. It was actually St. Peter's Day, June, I believe. And we know it was there because of the account books of the Draper's Guild, at that time the wealthiest of the London guilds. And at that time, the master of the Draper's Guild was a former Lord Mayor of London. So these are big shots that have got hold of a Morris dance uh, uh, for, for the afternoon. If we move on uh, uh, 70 years to 1541, we find the first reference to a sword dance in England. We don't know there was a dance, but the account books of the church wardens in Snettisham in Norfolk uh, recorded payment for a light for a sword dance. I'll come back to all these later. And then years later in Lancashire in Latham, we have a record of a sword dance taking place on Ash Wednesday. Again, more later, but probably performed by schoolboys from a Jesuit school about five miles away from Latham. Then, uh, uh, oh, in, yeah, 1638, then another 100 years, more than another 100 years, to somewhere between 1746 and 1769, we have the first Mummers play. It's a printed play, and um, which again might be surprising, and we don't know the exact print date, hence the two dates, but that was printed in Newcastle, and it was called a mock play as it is acted by the Mummers every Christmas. Then lastly, in 1779, we have what I've called a private variety show. There was a play often referred, well, I shouldn't say a play, there was a performance at Reevesby Abbey, the private home of uh, Sir Joseph Banks, the president of the Royal Society in Lincolnshire. Uh, and this performance wove together Morris dancers, uh, sword dancers, and uh, a mummer's play of uh, a one kind, a kind of wooing play, and a mummer's play. So that was um, really quite a complex bit of performance that made use of those three performances that we know about a little earlier. So, um, there will always be people who regard the absence uh, 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 of evidence as uh, not getting in the way at all of things happening, but from an evidential point of view, those are the earliest uh, uh, um, notions that we have. There's an earlier reference to a, um, a cup in a wheel with an engraving of a Morris dance. I'm sure many of you here this afternoon will be familiar with that, but for an actual dance, it's 1477. So, there we are. Rather than some river of folk coming from some distant past, there are some actual dates for uh, the earliest performances that we presently know of. So, um, the folk process, the art process. I hadn't come across the phrase, the folk process, until I was editing uh, the companion volume, and um, it, uh, it cropped up in uh, a few uh, places. Uh, Sorry, my pause is because I can't see some of my slide. Let me just uh, go here. Uh, if we take those earliest examples, we can see that in each case, there is always a particular set of reasons, a particular context for the performance, and always a series of choices for both the organizers and the performers. Uh, it's very clear that these aren't some remnants of an earlier imagined ritual whole of any kind. They are self-contained performance works. Uh, and I want to suggest that they were bundled together and they are indeed bundled together, I think in many people's present day thinking. I want to suggest they were bundled together, not by what they actually were at the time of their making, but rather because of what folklorists and collectors would subsequently make of them. There is nothing inherent in them that makes them part of one thing. That was a later set of decisions. Indeed, they start to look like created or commissioned performance pieces. In other words, um, we've got a Morris dance here. Do you fancy hiring us for Saturday afternoon? Or commissioned, we need something to enliven this parade. Could you guys knock something together for us? We'll give you a few pounds. And these created or commissioned pieces combine new and pre-existing collages of 
of, of themes that will be familiar, of personages that will be familiar. Um, and by personages, I mean things like uh, fools, heroes, villains, hobby horses, men, women, and so on. Uh, Theatograms, sorry, um, a, a bit of jargon there, uh, but something like a, a little plot extract or a little scene or a little piece of movement that's been part of earlier plays, uh, possibly even you know in other towns, in other countries, and so on. Um, a simple example would be something like the comedy in a mama's play where a quack doctor tries to cure someone. Uh, and event images again, just rather than bits of text, bits of visual action or particularly striking uh, images that have been used elsewhere that people have enjoyed. Uh, things that we would call in popular music these days sampling, where things are just borrowed and put into other things because people like them. So these are not only intertextual, by which I mean chunks of text and image get cut and pasted, but are increasingly intermedial, uh, whereby chunks of text and image recur in songs, tales, books, plays, pictures, photographs, videos, and so on. Um, and that, I think, uh, uh, is part of what we mean by the folk process, but it's also very much what we mean by the art process. In other words, there is nothing particularly folk uh, about any of those things happening, but they certainly do happen in what we think of as folk performance. Um, which makes it, uh, to my mind, all the more astonishing um, that this idea uh, should have should have cropped up a uh, hundred years ago, rather more than a hundred years ago. Now, I'm certainly, uh, I think it will become clear later, uh, I, this is not a have a dig at uh, Cecil Sharp by any stretch of the imagination. It's just that this is one of the most concise statements that I've come across of a very widely held view. Um, uh, I, I won't go through it there, uh, but it, it is, uh, or perhaps I should just think, uh, um, if people are, are not seeing it. Um, Sharp said that in Morris' Sword Dance and Mummer's play, we seem to intercept three stages of development, arrested and turned to its own uses by the uh, uh, civilised and social idea of entertainment. In the Oxford Morris customs, the earliest sacramental rite in the Sword Dance, the later human sacrifice, in the mumming play, the still later uh, um, uh, presentment on nature's annual death and renewal. Uh, and, and that idea, in one form or another, became extraordinarily central to the folk revival uh, and continued to be dominant through the first half of the 20th century. And in my view, it has been enormously influential not just on what people thought about these performances, but actually, to some extent, how they did them. It seems to me quite difficult um, uh, to avoid being influenced in some ways by that set of ideas. And I've said it unleashed a good deal of creative writing, master's, semi-scholarship, but most importantly, it unleashed multiple grapnels into the public consciousness. Uh, and I think that that becomes harder uh, to take when one's aware actually of the evidence base, which of course people were not aware of at the time that they were coming up with these ideas. So it was briefly de rigueur to view the oldish as very old indeed, uh, uh, like my grandchildren with me. So what we had was a very gradual development from the establishment of antiquarianism um, early 18th century through the pervading influence of romanticism, the eventual coining of the word folklore in 1846, and all of these ideas seem to coalesce in a long half century from 1865 to 1925. Now, 1865 is an important date in my thinking because that really was the year in which the last works of popular antiquarianism were published, things like Chambers' Book of Days and so on. And it was the year in which the very first works of recognizable anthropology were published, which showed 
a whole new way of thinking about things. And really, uh, um, through to the period after the Second World War, um, a kind of locked in a whole body of thought. Um, the Folklore Society, the Folk Song Society, the Folk Dance Society capture the disproportionate influence of that short period on conceptions of English folk. Their extraordinary popularity, their foundational success was rooted very much in the ideas of their day. Um, which were the ideas uh, encapsulated in that remark by Sharp. So between the earliest works of anthropology and a fully fledged folk revival, ideas about cultural evolutionism, survivalism, pagan origins, lost in the mists of timeness, merry Englandism, entered and settled in the public consciousness, and I've said rather like folk dance in schools. But those ideas really did settle and take a powerful grip. To my mind, um, this is the creation of genuine folklore. That's to say, deeply satisfying fictional explanatory legends for things that don't require them. Included interesting explanations for genres of popular performance that were attaching, note, not necessarily had attached, I reiterate, were attaching in many instances to different points of the calendar in different places, and not always the same points of the calendar. Uh, Mummers plays are a good example where, you know, it's widely known that we get them at Halloween, we get them at Easter, we get them at Christmas and so on. In hindsight, this was mythos, an overall body of myth masquerading as rational and scholarly history and thereby appealing to the classically informed, civilised and scientific mind of the late Victorian and Edwardian day. Creative readings such as Sharp's, which clearly still hold attraction in some aspects and in some quarters, came to be accepted as vague historical truths. That is to say, they became folklore. The idea of ritual to theatre also gained prominence at this time in the works of Jane Harrison, Sir Edmund Chambers, et al. Whereas on the other hand, and this is partly the point of today's talk, I incline to celebrate popular performance becoming customary. It is, if you like, uh, an inversion of uh, a very popular set of ideas. So back to my earlier slide, but uh, I brought up the Morris dance uh, to, uh, uh, as, as my first set of examples. So back to 1477. Now, um, my acknowledgements here, and I, know, I noticed that at least one of these people is present, but sparing their blushes anyway, uh, I'm very grateful to uh, the scholars Keith Chandler, John Forrest, Mike Heaney, and, and the late Roy Judge for their work. Um, because they've done an extraordinary amount to clarify this. Uh, I've called this the sights, the circumstances and drift of Morris dancing. We know that Morris dancing has been associated with the Royal Court, with urban streets, with church property, with the public stage, with rural locations, assemblies and the country dance hall and private premises. But it's never a neat or sharp chronology. As Forrest makes abundantly clear, there's never a straightforward succession. Individual contexts may have their heydays, but they never supersede one another. Things drift temporally and geographically, but there are points of emphasis where particular contexts become dominant. Um, Morris has in reality been a profoundly multi-form activity presented in the, in, in the professional theatre as pageantry in dance halls and churchyards as well as on village greens. It's appeared at the Jacobean Court in several plays produced between 1589 and the closure of the theatres, usually as a signifier of rustic life, in 18th century election campaigns in 19th century ales, and reappeared on stage with some frequency between 1801 and 1910, um, uh, often as uh, interval pieces or, or off-the-show pieces or introductions and so on. Um, and then my, my personal favourite, 
uh, at Crystal Palace in 1858, accompanied by the band of the Coldstream Guards. I think that's glorious. Uh, so I just thought, you know, a Morris dance in a civic watch parade in London, and then 500 years later, here's proof of evolution, if ever it was needed. Uh, we have a Morris dancers celebrating the Festival of Britain in 1951, and I've said presumed up north um, uh, because of the, uh, the kind of pom-pom things that they've got. I think it's a great picture. I will find more out about it one day. Uh, but if we stay put in London uh, after 500 years, we find again, um, you know, a very uh, exuberant and uh, energetic celebration of the Morris. But then I should probably say, sorry about the last two images. Surely this is the one I was looking for. Uh, if we had more visual images from the histories of Morris, would they be as striking in their distinctiveness as the three images I've just presented? Uh, I suspect that they would. We don't have visual images, or the ones that we do have tend to be 19th and 20th century, uh, but there is certainly a tendency to read the accounts, and we have plenty of good accounts, many of them catalogued by the scholars I mentioned earlier, but we tend to read those accounts with a particular visual image watermarked in our minds, watermarked on the accounts, so we tend to read them in a particular way. Why is it that some conceptions have stuck so fast? Um, it is in part to do, I think, with the nature of the folk revival, with the nature of the, uh, 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 the body of theorizing we've alluded to. Um, but I've also, uh, um, I'm quite interested. I've said, is it rooted in a uh, anti-theatrical authenticity? Uh, many people, uh, that I, you know, meet in folk performance worlds. Uh, authenticity in one way or another um, is a particularly important criteria. And they will often say, um, I know Ron Shuttleworth is here this afternoon, we've often talked about this, has very strong views that, that uh, mumming is not acting. Um, but I, I think that there is an interesting uh, uh, anti-theatrical or an anti-theatricalism in much folk performance that while actually being deeply theatrical, uh, seeks to avoid uh, associations with the theatrical. Just a personal view. Um, I'll move on just from Morris now to the, to the, to the uh, sword dancing again. Um, uh, we've, we've mentioned those two early performances. Um, in 1541, the sword dance light is noted in the church warden's accounts for Snettisham, Norfolk. Now, I, I particularly enjoy that because we have quite a clear 20th century, 21st century conception that the sword dance is a northeastern broadly uh, phenomenon and a tradition and a culture of performance that's developed there. But the earliest reference is in Norfolk. Um, I was just going to say again, uh, some wonderful uh, work undertaken by Georgina Boyce, uh, Stephen Corson, James Cummings, Thomas Pettit. Uh, recent work going on around the discovery of these references at the moment. Um, but that's, that's where the earliest one comes from. Interestingly, the accounts for Snettisham generally run smoothly, but there's a marked hiatus between 1537 and 1554. Prior to that, there are loads of reference to plough gatherings, um, which we assume to be plough trailing, plough stotting. There are lots of different words for this. Um, and, and plough lights. Suddenly, uh, all of those references in the account stop and they take on a different tone. This coincides with the banning of votive lights in churches from 1538, which seems to have filtered through to Snettisham by 1541, and in 1548 with charges made um, for the breaking up of altars. Uh, and suddenly, when it becomes probably quite a foolish thing to do, to start talking about votive lights and so on, they start accounting for sword dance lights. Uh, and um, uh, Cummings and Pettit think that this is not a votive light so much as actually uh, a light, a torch, um, uh, by, by, uh, to facilitate viewing uh, performances. 
Um, and then later, uh, uh, things get uh, back to normal when uh, Mary takes the throne, things ease up for a while before they, they disappear under Elizabeth. Um, but uh, I, I find that quite a, a fascinating uh, possibility that um, uh, sword dancing, uh, because plough trailing by, them, uh, by then was often used to raise funds to keep votive lights and so on, um, because it had devotional associations, that when one felt the need to avoid devotional associations, a sword dance seemed like a safer bet. There couldn't possibly be any harm in having a sword dance. And it made me think that perhaps a sword dance was more like um, uh, a works do rather than the, the fully fledged office party of plough trailing, uh, to, to, to put a modern take on it. So a, a politic move. This could be an early indication of interplay between plough trailing and sword dance as a discrete form. Um, uh, we can't be sure at the moment whether a sword dance was specially choreographed or brought in as a more neutral uh, vehicle for fundraising at the time. That's a much later image, uh, just pre-First World War West Halton in Lincolnshire of, uh, of, of plough trailing. Um, but there would have been some sort of procession with a plough uh, and, and the time arose in 1541 where in Snettersham they decided to replace that with a sword dance. Uh, we jump from 1541 to 1638. Um, William Blundell's mentioned the sword dance at Latham. He doesn't talk about the dance, but he noted down the prologue, which is a very theatrical little piece of writing. Uh, five miles from the Jesuit school at Scarisbrook Hall, Georgina Boys reasons that uh, William may have been a student in 1638, an Ash Wednesday performance which would fit with Stephen Corson's European-wide evidence for early sword dance performances on mainland Europe, particularly in the Low Countries from the 1380s onwards. And the later description provided by William's grandson uh, Nicholas in 1712 is, is a wonderful set of diary entries uh, from a work called his Great Diurnal, where he talks about teaching uh, a sword dance uh, to help celebrate the, the flowering of, of a new uh, mall pit, uh, an agricultural, a significant agricultural moment. Uh, what's interesting is that, uh, and Georgina Boyce, I'm entirely indebted to her for this, is that uh, many members of the Blundell family, uh, Lancashire at that time had the highest concentration of Catholics uh, in Britain. Uh, interestingly, Whitby, uh, was another area with a high concentration of, uh, of Catholics. Um, many priests and several generations of the Blundell family and other Catholic uh, members of the population uh, traveled to Flanders. There was an English college there. There was also an English college in Rome. The Catholics at that time used what we would now call educational dance and drama as part of their education at these colleges. Um, and it's quite possible that Nicholas, who went to school in Flanders, brought home, I've said, sufficient moves, may have learned the dance there and brought it over because he certainly enjoyed teaching it. Uh, uh, but again, counterintuitive that it should be on that side of the country. Um, rhetorically, <laughs> uh, is this the kind of less obviously devotional activity which may have put the authorities' minds at rest in Snettisham? the kind of sword dance that may have been lit in Snettisham? Is this the kind of performance that was enjoyed at Nicholas's Marl Pit? He certainly talks about having caps made for the performers, and I note there that some of them were still wearing caps. I'm being glib, forgive me. Or perhaps this is the image I was looking for. Again, just to try and indicate contrast in the way in which the dancers can be approached. Or, as earlier with the Morris, is this the image I was looking for? If we had more visual images from the histories of sword, would they be as striking in their distinctiveness as these three are? I reiterate, there is a tendency to read the accounts with a particular visual image watermarked on them, an image derived from a particular point in the history of the form. The evidence for Morrison's sword suggests performances where we don't expect them, that's to say, not in the Cotswolds and not in County Durham, at times when we don't expect them, Ash Wednesday, the middle of the summer, and so on in professional theatres, it doesn't always fit the later certainties. 
Uh, the third of my premieres, we move up to Newcastle now, and the first uh, Mummer's play that we know of. Um, now, uh, those of you who attended Steve Rowley's uh, recent talk on mumming, forgive me, but I I'll reiterate a point he made there. Let's not confuse convivial or non-play mumming with the much later mummers' plays, though convivial mumming never went away. Convivial mumming is the kind of activity we're now very familiar with from Newfoundland, for example, um, which means house visiting, uh, in disguise, often cross-dressed with disguised speech, playing all kinds of games of conceal and reveal uh, in, in, in other people's houses. That's a much earlier form uh, of mumming. Mummers plays, as you said, uh, the earliest one we know of um, up in Newcastle. And again, here acknowledgements to a lot of recent scholarship um, uh, and uh, um, uh, Carpenter and Twycross uh, may not be uh, Meg Twycross and Sarah Carpenter familiar to people in the folk world, but they're two excellent medieval theatre historians who've done a lot of work on masks and mummy. And then names that will be more familiar, uh, Duncan uh, Broomhead, Thomas Pettit, Peter Millington, Mike Preston, Paul Smith, uh, and the performance theorist Mike Pearson. I'm again very indebted to a lot of their recent work in this field. Uh, there's the cover of uh, Alexander and the King of Egypt, a mock play as it's acted by the mummers every Christmas. Again, I think it will be counterintuitive that our earliest evidence for a mummers play should come in printed form. Um, uh, again, it's not always what's uh, expected. Um, uh, it is a very uh, theatrical, it's an article piece, it's very theatrical, it has some very good gags in it. Uh, I'm, I'm not sure whether a mock play, as it is acted by the mummers every Christmas, is means that this is something that was well known and picked up in print uh, to encourage more people to do it, or is actually a really good piece of advertising by the printers of the chat books to make more people pick it up, thinking it was part of a custom. I've, uh, I've uh, um, discussed this at length in Mummers Plays Revisited. Um, then, uh, from just a year or two later, uh, I think this is rather uh, wonderful. It's an example of what I would call intertextuality. Um, uh, we have a wonderful account of a performance called The Siege of Troy uh, and, uh, in, a, in a booth at... Um, oh, could I just ask for a visual single from Beth or Pauline? Am I coming through? Could you give me a thumbs up if you can hear me? Thank you. I just had a message saying my connection was unstable. Thanks. Um, uh, the Siege of Troy uh, at Bristol Fair at a booth run by a man called Jobson in 1770. Um, and there's, there's a reasonably detailed account. Why I put it in here is that it, it contains a whole um, a fight to the, to, apparently to the death the appearance of a quack doctor and a resurrection using very similar language to that we're familiar with from uh, Mummer's plays. Uh, but what's wonderful uh, is it, it adopted uh, what we might call an experimental theatre technique of the time in London, which was life-size cardboard cutouts of Greeks and Trojans, because it is, after all, the siege of Troy. But it describes the two combatants uh, as dressed like professional boxers. Uh, and I, I um, this is the artist Paul Loudon, uh, you know, we worked together for him to achieve this kind of reconstruction and we're told in the account that there were three Welsh girls from Monmouth on the right, two drunken colliers from Kingswood on the left, Edwin uh, carried some brandy in a pint bottle, enjoying themselves there. We have to be cautious here because it is just possible that this was a puppet show, um, but they, uh, but we do know that they still had these large cutouts at the back. I like it because it jolts us. There is the, what some people have argued is the central focus of the Mummers play appearing in, in, at the same time, very early, um, in a different kind of performance context. Um, this is the kind of image we're, we're more familiar with. Um, uh, I think I saw Doc Rowe's name on the list of people. If he is here, you were there. I think we were both there on the same wet boxing day in Ripon 
in the 1970s. Um, this is my unashamed uh, favourite ever uh, uh, mumming play and mumming tradition. I, I, I've said it on my slide there, it, it was everything I've ever wanted a mummer's play to be. It was wonderful. Um, the performances were great. Nobody showed the remotest interest in it. The weather was awful. They gave nearly 50 performances every Boxing Day. I went up there for several years on the trot. Um, they used to, they've been shouted at uh, from upstairs windows because they'd start about eight in the morning on Boxing Day. Uh, people were still sleeping. They were waking them up with these great big cadging boxes asking for money. Um, uh, it was just, yet, um, it was a real case of perform or else. Nothing would have stopped them performing. They were absolutely determined to perform. And it was so important to them, it really didn't much matter what other people made of it. And uh, I just, I think they were great. I loved those performances. Here's a very different performance of a mummer's play. A theatre company in a small theatre in London, very recently doing an absolutely superb performance of half a dozen different mummer's plays. They completely removed it from all the contextual circumstances that I so personally enjoy about mumming and still made them work as remarkably odd bits of theatre. Uh, but once more, despite a very 250 year history, a particular style of presentation tends to be associated with ideas of authenticity. This, of course, is the Marshfield Paper Boys. So in each case, although I can't provide uh, uh, visual images throughout the history of these pieces, or it's difficult to do so, we do have accounts. And what I'm trying to say here is, can we perhaps break away in each case from particularly strong 19th century ideas of what these forms should look like. And lastly, moving from my three premieres to the private uh, variety show, um, again, uh, working with Paul Loudon to produce this, uh, this image uh, based on what we can figure out from the accounts and the texts that were made after the performance. Um, I, I like this because we don't often think about the, the minutiae of, uh, of what was actually happening when these performances were done. It was a rent day. Uh, um, Reevesby Abbey uh, isn't an abbey, it's a, it's a, it was a private home of the Banks family. Um, Sir Joseph Banks was um, a world traveller, genuinely a world traveller at a time when very few people could make that claim. President of the Royal Society sailed with Cook and so on. His sister, uh, Sarah Sophia Banks, um, uh, is well known, but, but in a different way. Uh, she was the foremost collector of her time of ephemera surrounding the private theatricals that were then enormously popular among the wealthy, um, whereby they would put on amateur performances, just like professional theatre performances, in their mansions, invite large audiences, um, and, she, and, and, and Sarah Sophia collected the ephemera around these events. It's my view that she probably um, event managed and coordinated this performance, which was on the annual rent day of the bank's estate, but which was the first visit of Sir Joseph's new wife, Dorothea Huggison, to uh, the family home, as far as we know. Um, so in the drawing, I, I like the idea of, um, uh, of Sarah Sophia there talking to one of her colleagues about what a wonderful performance they've got these local people to put on. Uh, and, and I just couldn't help imagining Sir Joseph thinking, what's she playing at? You know, I'm, my wife's going to be out of here, you know, in no time at all. This is truly dreadful. Um, this is the moment in the play where one of the performers emerges as uh, Cecilia, and, and all the other actors immediately are completely smitten. And this wooing play starts whereby they all make claims for her hand. Uh, the play itself is a fascinating mix of um, 
of mummers play, of Morris dancing, of sword dancing. And it's actually quite a complex uh, performance. There were two more performers than shown here who'd come from uh, a neighboring village and sang uh, songs before and afterwards. So again, just to try and jolt us out of our uh, usual ways of thinking about these events, um, this is a very deliberate bringing together a collage, a bricolage, if you like, of uh, different forms of popular performance that, that were around at the time, uh, brought together for a particular purpose. So, having gone uh, around uh, the houses with that somewhat, my three premieres and um, my variety show, uh, where I suppose in some ways I'm saying what's the difference here between what we're calling folk performance and any other kind of performance? Are there any indicators uh, that, that might really help us understand that there's something special about folk performance? And I think there are. And they fall into these categories. The spatial arrangements that govern them, matters of re reiteration and duration, time and place, and the all-important inheritance from the 18th and 19th centuries of uh, uh, particularly of, of, um, of romanticism. We'll have a very quick look at each of these. Spatial arrangements. Uh, I've said customary drama there, forgive me, I should have said performance. The spatial patterns of customary performance are rarely found elsewhere. Um, recent interest in site-specific performance, in mobile performance, walking performance. Th this is what um, um, sort of experimental theatre and performance art uh, at the, well, in the last decade have been playing around with those ideas. But they've come nowhere near the kinds of material that interests us. Just look at the words we've got. I, I, if you ever want to waste an afternoon with the Oxford Complete, uh, I, I got hung up on peas and walkabout. Uh, the pageants, parades, promenades, perambulations, peregrinations and processions. We've got all these different words for reasons. They're wonderfully specific. They move people together and apart. They facilitate different kinds of encounters and assemblies. They make possible arrivals and departures, entrances and exits. All of these are a central feature of customary performance, which seems to foreground movement, visiting, and assemblage, things that you don't always find in other forms of performance. And this provides shape and emphasis for performance with a particular impact, but most importantly for me, a very particular social aesthetic. And I've just mentioned in passing, I'm sure the people are here this afternoon who can tell me this is wrong, but I think the long way set of country dance provides a wonderful synecdoche whereby the part represents the immensely greater whole. I think the long way set is a microcosm of what a lot of folk performance does, which is just arrange lots of meetings in sequence, which other forms of performance don't do. Uh, secondly, reiteration and duration, time and place. Um, all folk performances come and go, are revived in different places, change with time, yet they somehow achieve a special relationship between people, time and place, and they appear to do so quite quickly. Whatever meanings derived from events during an individual experience seems to depend on their perceived longevity. Yeah, they don't have to be ancient pagan rituals. This all happens quite quickly. I think that the annual seasonal or calendar repetition of the same thing in the same place, which is rare, even the most obvious example, it's not usually the same pantomime in the same theatre with the same actors every year, but those performances can soon impact on social arrangements and the memories that we forge. Richard Sheckner, the performance theorist, his understanding of theatre as restored behaviour, I think, is very helpful here. And Joseph Roach, his insights regarding the stimulus of restored behaviour to the production of cultural memory. What folk performance does is do the same things time and again in the same place. And I think that inculcates a very particular uh, 
kind of experience of performance. It jolts memory in a variety of fascinating ways, and it makes memory in a variety of fascinating ways. Romanticism. Knowing oneself to be part of a reiteration, whether as performer, participant or spectator, however boisterous the event, as a quietly serious dimension. Uh, this is something that uh, touches me personally uh, whenever I'm around uh, certain kinds of folk performance. Marvin Carlson, American theatre practitioner and scholar, spoken of things coming back in the theatre as a ghosting. You know, the different productions of the same plays take on a very special quality for people who uh, like to go and see the same things in the theatre in different productions. Jack Derrida uh, has arrived at the idea of hauntology, um, a, a wonderful, serious consideration about whatever ghosts might be, if you like. But here he's concerned with matters of the presence of the past in the present. And I think that's something that we get when we experience what we think of as folk performance. Mama's plays, Morris dancers, sword dancers have a remarkable capacity to remind us of their own past performances in the present moment of our watching. And I like the term pentimento, I overuse it, usually used of paintings to describe how earlier iterations can show through the surface of a present finished version. And I think that happens very powerfully uh, among those of us who enjoy these performances when we see them. Uh, in conclusion, the difference between folk performance and other performance has often been perceived as largely self-evident. It isn't. We should think about it harder and longer. There are no simple or overriding choreographic or theatrical grounds for a collective separation of all or any of these examples from non-folk performance, but there are contextual grounds. Methods of transmission so often stressed as distinctive in a wider folk discourse are not entirely separable from those of the academy or the theatre. I sometimes hear people talking about, you know, the special qualities of oral transmission and so on. And I think, well, how do you think actors get trained? How do you think dancers get trained? How do you think plays get put on? How do you think movies get made? How do you, you know, um, it won't do. Uh, it's not that simple. Uh, folk is a helpful descriptor for a range of material, but it's also an evasive term. The more one tries to pin it down, the more its definitional and distinctive qualities seem to slide away. In acknowledging that custom and creativity are not merely compatible, but co-requisite across all the arts and not only the folk arts, we better acknowledge our forebears and at the same time, alongside everybody else's forebears, as creative and skilled makers, organizers, and practitioners, rather than activistic, unquestioning bearers of unconsidered custom. Uh, whew, that's more than enough for this wet afternoon. There I leave it, and I hope I haven't gone on too long. Uh, and I hope it hasn't been too dense. As I said, 600 pages into 45 minutes was trickier than I thought it would be when I agreed. All right, thank you, Peter. So, um, ooh, I've got a long, something long in the chat here. It might be easier to tell everybody. Richard, Richard Marshall, do you want to tell everybody what you've written to me in the chat? Can you come out of the screen share, Peter? Uh, yes, sorry. That's right. Uh, uh, yeah, the no, top. Some to. stop. Oh, stop share. Yes, In red. Yeah, that's pretty straightforward. Yeah. Brilliant. Have we got Richard Marshall? Bang in the middle of my screen. <laughs> He's talking, but he's got his... He's on mute, Pauline. You need to unmute yourself, uh, Richard. That's it. Yeah. Talk. 
Oh. Oh. I think he's unmuted, but the sound isn't working. I've come across that before. Oh, yes, we can't hear him. All right, just, do people want to... Um, I better read out his thing in a minute. Um, do people want to, while I'm just looking at that, can you, if anyone wants to ask a question, um, under reactions, raise hand or wave. Paul Smith waved. Whether you can hear me is a different question. Cool. Okay. Um, I've got a couple of comments. I always do. Um, the Alexander and the King. Can people hear? Okay, I've got a lot of. Sorry, Paul. Can you start again? Something's happened. Um, we had to mute some people. So, can you unmute yourself and start again, Paul, please? Okay. Um, Mike Preston and I were talking about the Alexander and the King of Egypt chat book a couple of nights ago, different context, but the thing that we were discussing about it is it's potentially something that was produced for antiquarians, as was a lot of material which was published by that printer. Um, and if you look at what's previously in the 19th century being written about it, it's in the vein of, I've got a copy of this. They're not saying, I saw a performance of this. We don't see any comments coming from performers um, relating to this particular chat book. So whether it's any influence whatsoever on local traditions, um, I don't know what to say about it after that. The only thing is that Colander and Dixon in Whitehaven picked that text up and used it. So potentially there may have been um, actual performances based on it in uh, Cumbria. But there have yet any comment about we use this chat book or that text appearing as uh, an account of a performance has uh, yet to be discovered. Um, the piece on um, Reevesby and Joseph and Sarah Sophia Banks, um, I don't like Peter's, sorry Peter, <laughs> I don't like your use of private theatricals. You're correct about her, you're, you're, the, the family was into uh, private theatricals, but we do not know that this is private in the sense of um, where it was performed. Um, Banks had rent day dinners all over the place. Um, so they begin around about rent day and they go on um, through several months towards Christmas, which may also account for the allusion to Christmas in the text. And um, they were frequently held in pubs uh, because his estates were vast. Now, he didn't attend all those rent day dinners, uh, but there's no comments in or around the text that tell us it was uh, a performance actually in uh, on the estate or in the house. Uh, it may have been done in the Red Lion, which is the local pub there. Um, the, um, and another thing which comes into that is Sarah Sophia had two copies of it. The first one was a rough draft um, without any punctuation or anything in it. Um, but it wasn't done, I don't think it was done during the performance because one of the pages has been chopped off on the bottom uh, when somebody made a mistake and then the page is turned and the text continues on the other side. If you were taking it down during performance, you wouldn't have chance to be doing that. But it is definitely a rough copy um, in what I would say is perhaps not a learned hand. And then she gives that to Benjamin Stevenson, the estate manager, and says, could you write me that out, please? 
So that text seems to be something which has been produced outside the family and she wants for her collection. Um, the only other thing that I've got to say is, is a question for Peter. I'm not certain where you got the term folk process from. Um, it sounds a bit of a hodgepodge to me. I think quite in the accepted sense from the perspective of a folklorist, folk equals people. So how do you have folk process? People process? No. Nah. Um, tradition is the process. Um, but I'll leave you to cogitate on that. One thing that I've used um, about, you know, you're talking about sharp bringing ideas and putting a plan out for people that this is what this is all about and let's follow it, is uh, when working on legend and also on um, violence in mumming plays, uh, sorry, in mumming traditions in Newfoundland, um, I've used the idea that uh, a folk history develops. Uh, which is followed and regurgitated. Um, and in that particular case in, in Newfoundland, it's that, you know, a, a murder in 1861 was um, the reason that it was banned, uh, mumming was banned and the ban is still in place today. Well, in fact, the ban is not in place today. It was taken off the statutes years ago. So uh, okay, but that sums up my comments. <laughs> Peter, I think there was a question in there. Do you want to answer that? Um, yeah, I'm not. Um, well, uh, yes, I agree. Uh, folk process wasn't a phrase I'd heard, heard before. It cropped up in some of the uh, uh, draft uh, submissions for the Routledge Companion. Um, but yes, uh, tradition. I think uh, the users of it were referring to the way in which they believed that certain kinds of performance were modified over time. Yeah, no more than that. Um, the, uh, uh, the notion of private theatricals, yeah, it's a loose term. Really, um, it gets used by theatre people to refer to performances that were um, organised by estate or home owners, uh, whatever the scale. There were some near Wrexham where you could have 2,000 people turning up to see things, but they'd still call them private theatricals. So forgive the loose usage. But I take your point that we don't, we can't specify the location of the performance. I, 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 my instincts tell me that the performance was devised. I completely agree with you. And I said in the book that it was written down later. Um, you know, I think it was, it was uh, practically devised and then later recorded would be my view. Mm. Um, can you still hear me? Yeah. Um, the, to the group, if anybody's interested, um, the... Alexander and the King of Egypt chat book study that Preston and I did, and the two versions of the Reevesby, um, and also the Christmas rhyme book, which is about the chat books in Northern Ireland. Um, I think most of those are available. If anybody wants copies, I can probably scrounge them up for you. Just um, email me. Yeah. Uh, can I just add that if anyone wants anything to go out to the whole group afterwards, if you email me, I'll okay. put it in the post event email that goes out. So everyone will get it. Okay, thank you. Um, next up is Susan Wolf, please. Hi. Um, I'm sorry, I'm not being snotty and not showing my face at when when the lockdown first lockdown you know, when we all the Zoom stuff really got started, I thought there was something wrong with my computer. So at the end of the first lockdown, Geeks on Wheels came to my flat and said, Susan, there's nothing wrong with your computer. It's your laptop. It's just so old. It doesn't have a camera. <laughs> so that's why I'm, I'm, I'm not seeing. But can, can you hear me? Yeah, okay. Um, I had I had two two questions and, um, and one little personal thing. Um, what what is plow gathering and was that at planting season at what time of the year was that i'm not familiar with the term and also very curious about one of one of the slides shown when was cardboard invented i didn't realize cardboard was that old and the third question was that i would and this is just personal i would love to somehow touch bases with the person from who's attending this from Minneapolis where I lived for many years and 
don't know how to get that my email address to that person, whoever she is. But um, if, if that would be possible. Uh, yeah, uh, okay, right. uh, oh, you go first, Peter. Okay. Uh, um, uh, plow trailing uh, takes place in January, uh, and it uh, usually involved um, uh, a large group of people walking around. Most villages had what was called a common plow, um, which uh, farmers who couldn't afford their own plows would have access to. So it was a fund. Uh, raising uh, uh, opportunity um, uh, early in January. Uh, secondly, I shouldn't have said cardboard, I should have said pasteboard, sorry. What, what, is, what is pasteboard? Uh, it's like cardboard, but it was invented earlier. I mean, is it sort of the same kind of thing of whatever? I'm, I'm just, I'm, I'm curious, I'm, I'm a social historian. So things that people were using for stuff fascinates me and I just never heard of that. I'm, I'm sorry, apart from knowing um, that uh, some theatre producers used it for scenic effect, I have not looked into its composition, but I'm sure it would be something that would be easily Googleable. And what's it called again? Taste board. Taste board. I'm writing it down. Thank you. Thank you very much. And, 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 and how could the person from Minnesota reach me. Um, if you could both put your names in the chat. Well, I know yours, Susan. My chat function doesn't work. I can't do that. No, well, I know yours, but if the other person can put their name, can message me in the chat, then I'll put you two in contact. Thank I think you. she may have left, Pauline. Oh, have they left? Okay. I've with them. I was just... Um, and I... She may have left. Okay, well, I'll, I'll check in with you later, Beth, then. Thank you. Right, um, over to Sue Allen now, please. Hi, can you hear me? Yeah, it's really a question, not for Peter, but for it was just um, to Paul uh, on about the Alexander and the King of Egypt chat book. Um, there surely is a record of performance in Cumbria. It's in Hone, 1823 or 1826. A correspondent writes in about small boys performing um, the Alexander play in the streets of Whitehaven. Can you unmute, Paul? Can't hear you, Paul. I don't know why it keeps jumping out. Um, there, and there are others, but it's the relationship to the Alexander text that's not there. Sorry, what do you mean? Well, what we're getting is in, in Cumbria. Yeah. Right. We're getting references to plays and things. Yeah. And performances, but mm -hmm. not Alexander and the King of Egypt. No, the Hone reference specific, the correspondent specifically references Alexander and the King, the of, King Egypt. of Egypt. Yeah. It's 1823 or 1826. I can't remember which. Thing. And it's somewhere in this mess. I call an office because I was looking at it very recently. Okay. <laughs> Are you just confused me? I'm in Cumbria and I'm doing research on Cumbrian stuff. So. Yeah, there's also um, a set of letters from um, a woman sent to her uncle in 1861 or something. Yeah. I sent it round to some people uh, yeah. and it's been republished as a, a pamphlet. By um, Alan Cleaver? That's the one. Yeah, yeah. I'll do those. Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. I've got those. So thank you very much. Uh, I think that was all. Actually, I was just just querying the Alexander references. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, of course, Hone is an antiquarian. Yeah, I oh, know. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> it, it was just a question that that said there were no references to performances when his correspondent clearly was, uh, uh, you know, somebody from Whitehaven reporting on a performance of the Alexander play. Yeah, I could be heretical and suggest that. Maybe not everything that went into the it that set of four was, volumes was yeah. a, a real living correspondent and well, I quite agree, but I think piece it, of journalese. Oh yeah, yeah, it, yeah. it could well be the case, but you know, yeah. clear reports of boys going house to house in the street, urchins. I mean, they weren't described as being very reputable boys performing, but they were performing. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Thanks. 
Thank you. It's a, it's a very performable text. Okay. <laughs> okay, so we go to Richard Marshall, please, now. Can you unmute yourself, Richard? Well, well hopefully we'll hear him this time. No, it's still not working. Oh, what a shame. <laughs> no, we can't hear you, Richard. So Try on that. Anything? Any oh. I, uh, yes, say something. No, it's working now, Richard. Speak. Oh, no, it stopped. Again. Is that better? Yes. Yes. Oh, why? <laughs> Well, yeah, that's, that's, that looks like the wrong microphone, but never mind. Okay, uh, I mean that was. Uh, I, I'm approaching this. I'm, I'm not uh, an academic in this area. I'm uh, a science academic, um, and so I'm approaching this from uh, the performer's point of view. Uh, and uh, we've run a Morris team here, not a Morris, a Mummers team here in Cold Ash, uh, which is near Newbury in Berkshire, um, for about 27 years, um, having had a community play, and it came out of that. Um, and, you know, we started off in a sort of trying to be very traditional uh, in our style, you know, traditional in inverted commas, <laughs> perhaps, as Peter is, is suggesting. Uh, but we very much found our own way. And I think that's that's right, that, that things should develop, you know, that things shouldn't be sort of set down too hard. And there is another uh, band team, or you want to call them, uh, not very far away, who are very much more in the, in what we think of the, as a traditional style with the the ribbons and uh, in disguise, we're, we're much less like that. I think part of the reason is that only a couple of us have got any sort of um, uh, Amdram experience, uh, myself and, and, and one other, and the others are, are people who just want to perform and want to uh, uh, really bring the spirit of Christmas, I suppose it is, to the community. Uh, and I think that's is that very much that interaction. There's a lot of interaction with the uh, with, with our audience uh, and a lot of um, uh, improvisation that goes on continually so that although there's normally a script uh, it's it's really just the core of what we do and it expands out from that and I think that's very much uh, how I see it and, I, and I, I'm so pleased that somebody's actually saying that you know it doesn't come from a fixed point that it's it, it's much more um, uh, organic uh, than that so I mean it, I, I'm, it's not really a question there I'm afraid but it, it's just sort of uh, you know going along with your thesis uh, I'm very very pleased to hear that thanks Peter well I, I would just say that I, I'm um, I'm I'm interested in um, any any acts of um, what would the word be I suppose the the reconstruction or or any efforts say the Globe Theatre in London where a lot of thought and efforts gone into trying to reconstruct something and make it work and find out more about how it might have worked at a particular time and what things might yeah. have looked and sounded like and so on there's always room for that, um, but there's also, um, uh, so, I, you know, I, I greatly enjoy uh, uh, what seem to me to be efforts to accurately represent 19th century mumming and so on. Oh, yeah, yeah, uh, I, I, I'm I'm just, yeah, yeah. I'm, I just, it's a broad church, I think there's lots yeah. of room. Yeah. Oh yes, yeah, and we, yeah, we found our own pathway. And yeah, I, I think great. that's important, yeah. Um, yeah. and you know, it's uh, it, it works for us. Yes, uh, th there are you know some some hints of uh, of tradition. I mean, I, I play the doctor, and I I have ribbons on my uh, tailcoat, you know, so that's obviously there. But I'm not in otherwise. I'm not in disguise. Um, and uh, you know, the other people uh, playing playing that you know, very much do it as as they think and and we've developed a lot we've brought in uh, some new characters uh, and that that just that organic aspect seems to be very important to me uh, with some you know nods to the uh, uh, to the past you see i i also think that across all of these things there have been periods in particular places where there was a, a more small c conservatism than in other times and other places so if you read uh, Keith Chandler's wonderful work on on the uh, you know the South Midlands Morris and so on. He talks one instance of four generations of a family. So there's absolutely yeah. tremendous continuity. I guess um, what I question is the sort of the automatic assumption 
that it was always thus everywhere. Yeah. I don't think that's true. Yeah, that, that, that's, I definitely go along with that, yes. Thank you. Thanks, Richard. Uh, can we now go to Stephen Rowley? Can you unmute yourself, please? There we go. Can you hear me? Yeah, it's jolly good. Thank you very much, Peter. Really enjoyed the uh, really enjoyed the talk. Um, uh, and uh, it's a comment really that relates to what Paul was saying about folk process, because it's a term that I hear quite often. And um, and I wonder how that relates back to um, people like Cecil Sharp. Uh, in particular, I was thinking about what extent the form of folk performance today is determined by the beliefs of the of the revivalist, the person who you know plays the major role in the revival of things like Morris and Sword, which Cecil Sharp clearly did, and your quote, um, you know, clearly put his 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 point of view on the map. And Maud Carpless, obviously closely related to him and the revival of Mummers with the uh, Marshfield Mummers. You know, they were both uh, steeped in that sort of Fraser. Uh, approach that you know that obviously has a, a major effect on how we perceive not just what a, a performance of those things should be what is traditional but also the process by which they came uh hmm that's a quite right i think um well i think it does i think it does um but not everyone agrees with me. Uh, Steve Rowd in his review of Mummer's Plays Revisited uh, uh, clearly doesn't think uh, that these people and these bodies of thought have had much actual influence on what gets done. Uh, I disagree. Uh, I think, um, you know, Marshfield is, 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 is one very clear example, I think, where the will of a folklorist uh, with a very particular set of views on the ritual origins of customs um, has, has had a strong impact. But there are clearly lots of places where there appears not to have been such influence. At the moment I'm working on, uh, there are some fascinating references from the um, uh, 19th century, um, uh, Almost as soon as Mama's plays started being performed, some people were complaining about them being in decline. Yeah. Now, I'm not quite sure what they mean, and it's very hard to figure it out. But I think some of it is stylistic. And we know that people like Thomas Hardy and Violet Alford, uh, sorry, not Violet Alford, uh, Charlotte Byrne, were particularly, they talked a lot about this um, this odd style of acting, this kind of mumbling, uh, this very quiet or very, you know, uh, stand against the wall, one person step out and so on. And I'm wondering if, if, if it is those kinds of performances which have been regarded as in some way particularly authentic that are actually what the commentators of the time were talking about when they talked about the decline. So, um, all of this is something that I want to give a lot more thought to and try and dig out more evidence. There are, I want to try and date this notion of the decline of something that was then so new. Uh, and that's what's intriguing me at the moment. And then I might have a sharper answer. But there is no doubt that in some quarters, uh, those ideas about what those performances were influenced those performances. I cannot see that it could be otherwise, particularly post revival. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Stephen. Um, so next up is uh, Sue and John Swift. Yeah, but thank you. Thank you very much. And, and thank you, Peter, for a very stimulating talk. All, all I wanted to do, I, I worked in the cardboard box industry for uh, 25 years, and I think I can help with the question of uh, distinction between cardboard and uh, pasteboard and other, other, other types of solid board. Um, you, you've rocketed in my estimation. <laughs> <laughs> not, not hard, perhaps. <laughs> Thank you. Um, 
as, as far as I recall, I'd, I'd have to look it up if anybody really wanted the definitive date. But as far as I recall, what what we commonly refer to as cardboard or corrugated board was was first manufactured probably in the early 1800s. Um, before that, um, and, and you're absolutely right, Peter, what you, what you had before was what was called pasteboard or solid board, which essentially was sheets of paper stuck together, it was indeed just pasted together. And, and you could really make it as, as thick as you liked. And as, as far as I can recall, that would have been around from the sort of 1600s, may, maybe even earlier, maybe even the, you know, the, maybe the Chinese or the Egyptians may, may have had it as well. So I just help, hope that that um, solves that particular issue. Thank you. Well, I wasn't expecting that. Okay. Um, <laughs> <laughs> so next up is David Foote. Thank, thank you, John. David. Yeah, hello. Hold on, you're muted. Can you, um, I don't know what happened. Can you? How's that? Is that done? Yep, okay. Mine really is just um, referring to the two people who are doing some research about some of the mumming plays in Cumbria. Um, although I've just moved down to the flatlands of Cambridgeshire, I moved just down six months ago from Cumbria and as a part of Furnace Morris dancers and Furnace Mummers. And they have been performing Mummers plays of one style or another since um, mid 60s which they, they collected from the local villages in Furness. So I, I don't know, I, I understand that there was something happening in, in Holm, but um, if you get in contact with Furness Morris, then you will also find that they have um, a repertoire of, of mama plays. And they actually, well, we came up with a, a new version of that we then performed at Christmas, a children's version effectively, uh, using Father Christmas, but also having some other characters where the, it's the, uh, the stealing of the presents that uh, creates the rumpus rather than the, the death of a particular person. So uh, please look it up from them. Can I Thank just you. respond, do you mind, about the Furness ones? Because they were all Stuart Lawrence's uh, collection. I indexed and catalogued his manuscripts and sent them all off to the Vaughan Williams Memorial Library. So all Stuart's notes and texts are in the Vaughan Williams Memorial Library. Okay, brilliant, good to hear. You might want to get hold of the, the new uh, Christmas version. I can't <laughs> say it's of uh, massive quality, but uh, the kids would enjoy it. <laughs> Thanks. Thank you. Brilliant, thank you, David, and thank you, Sue, for knowing so much about it. So, um, Susan Wolfe again. Thank you, and and thank you for, for to John Swift who who knows about what pasteboard is. I love that. I, I found my group. It's wonderful. Anyway, my my question was um, when I associate Morris dancing with you know with the bells, and am, am I wrong? And when did um, I mean certainly in the fifteenth century people didn't have little bells to sew onto their onto their clothes or shoes. So when did some of those things come into Morris dancing? Uh, I'm the wrong person to ask. Is, does anybody know? I might be the right person to ask. Thank, thank you. Um, uh, on then, Mike. Yeah, okay, first of all on bells. Yes, you get, um, certainly bells are being mentioned by the 16th century and you get uh, in the rates books of the custom house when they were being imported from the continent you get the price for so, so many hundred morris bells six pounds or whatever so yeah bells have been around since the beginning um, basically 15th century um before i get onto the thing i really wanted to say you're going to hate me for this peter no it's not 1477 the earliest date is 1448 um but it's still the gold it's still the livery companies but it's a nice private event at the, their annual feast on 19th of May 1448, the Goldsmiths Company hired a, a set of Morris dancers to perform for them. Um, but uh, yeah, what I really wanted to say was going again, going back to what you said about, at the beginning about you know, you know, all of these traditions were invented by people with creativity. And it just 
reminded me of Cecil Sharp's response when he met Thomas Cadd of Yardley Gobian in 1910, because here was a guy who had, in a sense, invented his Morris dance, uh, and so Sharp pretty well dismissed it as, you know, this is just a fake. But um, Cadd had, um, he was born in um, Northamptonshire, um, quite close to Yardley Gobian. He had seen the Brackley Morris men um, performing when he was a boy. He then moved up to Lancashire and saw Morris dancing um, of the style you get in the, the Rushcart area. I think it was mainly he was in the Rushcart area rather than a West Lancashire area. Uh, then he comes back again and he's asked if he can get some dancers together for the typical Millie Village May Festival. Um, you know, following on from all of the um, the what you were alluding to, the Victorian Romantic May Festival. And uh, there's a wonderful picture of him. He dresses up as Robin Hood, but he's a fool character. He's got boys and girls in it. So he's got all of this mishmash of Brackley, the Northwest, the May processions, and the, May, the May festivals, all coming together. And he, you know, he, he led these Morris dancers for you know, 20 or 30 years or more. Um, and you know, he, 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 to me, is, is a typical example, just having to know about it, of a, you know, of a performer who, in other days, might have been looked at with different pair of spectacles, whom Sharp totally, you know, rebutted and, and went away from because he didn't understand that that was actually the kind of thing that you've been talking about how about how this stuff really happens. So, but thank you anyway. Enjoy, much enjoyed the talk, and I've uh, got one or two phrases that I'm certainly going to use in the future. So, thank you. Thanks, thanks very much, Mike, and thanks and thanks for the detail, which is always appreciated. Thank you. Thank you, Mike. Uh, next up is Jeff Lawson. Can you unmute, Jeff? Hi. Um, right. A uh, few things about the sword dancing. One is that unless they're specifically saying this is a link sword dance, we don't know what the early sword dances were. Uh, they could have been like Plymouth Morris men doing Morris with cutlasses. Um, in Nicholas Blundell's diary, uh, which was mentioned, the great diurnal, he mentions seeing a sword dancer in a pub in Preston who was a sole girl, one girl, doing a sword dance, I think with a pot of ale as well, but I'd have to look that up. So um, sword dance could be anything, uh, unless they say it's uh, like, which is what we think of. Uh, so you've got to be careful on that. Locations. It was all over the country. Um, Sh it, it, Sharp was the one that looked in Yorkshire and the North East. He, he's changed perception, but uh, it, it, I'm sure Sue Allen will fill in details. There's loads of mentions from Cumbria. Um, there's obviously the Lancashire ones. Um, Sharp in his postcards, one of the postcards from a vicar said there was sword dancing at Dean near Bolton. You know, um, so you know, the, the perception of location being the, the northeast is actually Sharp's perception. Um, and and uh, one more thing um, on uh, Nicholas Blundell, he did his um, it for the flowering of his mile pit, which was a summer event, but he also um, had it performed at uh, Twelfth Night, ah. which is the, the usual time of year. Um, I, and he also knew the local Morris dancers, the Sefton Morris men. So again, we don't know it was a link sword dance. He might have made a sword dance where they were just dancing with swords instead of sticks. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So. I think, um, thanks Jeff, um, I think that um, uh, uh, Georgina Boyce carefully uh, argued lecture for the Historical Dance Society, it's a few years ago now, that, that I was drawing on. Um, partly it's because of course and sense of detail of the kinds of dances that were going on in Flanders and that region earlier that I think uh, 
uh, perhaps suggest that it could have been a Hilton Point, you know, a linked, a linked dance. But you're quite right that we don't know, and it could indeed be anything. Uh, but if he did bring a sword dance back from there, there is some chance it might have been the kind that we that we now think of. But I take your point, absolutely. Brilliant. Thank you, Jeff. I think this better be the last question now from Patrick Ryan. Can you unmute yourself and start again, please? There. Sorry, I thought I had. Um, great. From another life. <laughs> it's been a long time. It was a great lecture. Yeah. Great lecture. Um, I wasn't going to talk, but there were so many people talking about Cumbria. And if you know this, I apologize. But you might, something I came across years ago, um, Beatrix Potter wrote two articles for the Horn Book Magazine, which is the children's literature journal in America. And in, this was just before the war. It was part of the war effort to get Americans sympathetic. Um, but in both of them, she, I think she described, I think it was both of them, she described not Mummer's plays, but uh, Morris dancing, sword dancing, and social dancing. I can't remember if it was for Fate or Country for the Horses Fair in Cumbria. Um, and then also uh, Kaylee's or Country Dances in her barn for both Harvest and, and Christmas time. So I've always wondered if she had anything in her papers. I've never, you know, accessed them that might talk about the dance scene in Cumbria. And I believe in one of the articles, she actually said she was an officer for Cumbria for the English Folk Dance and Song Society. So if any of you doing research on Morris in Cumbria have not come across that, that might, I, there might be something there, that's all. But thanks, it was a lovely afternoon. Sorry, can I just respond <laughs> again? I'm sorry, people keep oh, that, yes. Umbria in. Um, she also wrote about club dancing and country dancing in her children's books, The Fairy Caravan, is it? Um, so she was certainly aware of them. It wasn't, she wasn't a dancer herself at all. Um, it was her husband, Willie Healis, who is a member of the local EFDSS uh, groups between the war. I have a photograph somewhere of him doing a country dance and they used to practice in her kitchen and she used to take them, uh, she used to drive their old car and take him and his friends to uh, country dances in the area. Never heard anything about sword, but certainly country dancing and club dancing. That's what I know. That's great. Well, <laughs> thank you. That, 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 I've wondered about that ever since I was doing some research. Yeah. But I haven't seen those references that you mentioned, so I shall look those out. Look for the Horn Book. It's it's um, very you. famous journal in America, but it's in the British Library. Thank you. Brilliant. Well, I think that's all the questions, and we're just gone three minutes over, so that's fine. And uh, so could I ask you to all unmute yourselves, please? And we'll give Peter a massive round of applause.